We're going to start a new series this morning, Avoiding Satan's Snares or Cautions for Christians. Whichever you prefer. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 119 this morning. We're going to look at the first three verses in 65, 66 through 68. Um, we're going to talk about this morning, don't stray. Cautions prevent calamity. Would you agree with that? That's why we have stoplights at four-way crossing and a T-bar. If we didn't, people would be running in to each other all of the time. Caution lights on emergency vehicles. That tells us to get out of the way because they're driving faster than we're driving. They're in a hurry. So we need to move aside and let them have the right of way. Again, if we don't move aside, that can create a, a problem. Cut. The Word of God warns us and cautions us about moving away from our spiritual foundation which is probably the easiest thing in the world for a Christian to do. A life without trials, a life without cautions, will lead to straying from God. When everything is going great, and you've got plenty of money, the kids are doing great, the job's going good, it's, it's easy to get away from God and, start, and stop praying and studying the way you were. And we're going to find out in the psalm this morning that God has a remedy for that. Now, you may not like the remedy, but it is God's remedy, and um, it's good. And we're going to see it that also in our text this morning. Are we straying or are we staying close to God? Where are you this morning? Would you stand with me if you found your place? Psalm 119. Beginning with verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your words. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. There's a consequence for every choice that we make. There's a consequence for every sin that we commit. We studied about Moses this morning. Moses' consequence of his rebellion was he did not get to see the promised land. What will our consequences keep us from receiving this year? What will our choices cause us to do? Are we straying or are we staying? Let's pray. Father, bless your word as it goes out this morning. I pray, Father, that uh, the uh, exposition would be simple so that even a small child might understand. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before I get started, there was another thing I needed to add to the prayer list, and that's Miss Clarice Thomas. Uh, she fell at all the care of this past week and broke her leg, her upper leg, shattered the pain right there. And she's in the hospital at Mercy. Hopefully, she will get to come back Monday or Tuesday to all the care of uh, Sweet lady, uh, if you're ever in all the care, stop by. Uh, we're in two, the 202, 201. Stop by and pay her a visit. She would love to see you. As we look at our text this morning, these verses illustrate that God disciplines us in order to save us. Now, discipline is not good, is it? You can be honest. No, it's not. Nobody enjoys it. We didn't enjoy it as children. We don't enjoy it as adults. And as Christians, we don't enjoy it. But God has to do it. And when God does it, God is still good, still loving, still compassionate, still cares about you. But He does that to bring you back in line with His Word and His rules and His way. It is easy for a Christian to be in a good period of life and to slip away from God. God wants your total, your total obedience, your total commitment. Uh, he wants you focused on Him, and you are, He should be your 
priority in life as we go into 2020. As we look at our verses this morning, the first thing that I see in verse 65 it is a confession. And notice what it says. The, the psalmist talks about the treatment. It says, you have dealt with your servant. I love that. Have dealt. Performing an activity with a distinct purpose or goal. God is working in your life to accomplish a goal that he has set for you as a Christian. All right. And then when he does that, he does it because he loves you, because he cares about you. He's not doing it frivolously. Nothing happens by accident in a Christian's life. Amen. And we need to get in line with God so, so God does not have to deal with us in a harsh way to get us back where we can be happy in Jesus if we trust and obey. Isn't that what the psalm says? So God is dealing with, with, with this man. And, and notice, uh, he, he says, you have dealt well, good, morally, correct. The psalmist realizes that his whole life, God has been good to him. Has God been good to you? Amen. Is God good to you? Amen. Absolutely. And when I look at my life, and I know that God is dealing with me with a distinct purpose and a goal in mind for me, for my life, he's got one for your life, he's doing it good, morally good, correct, and proper, then I should get in line with what God's doing and not rebel and not fight against it. Secondly, look at the title that he gives himself. He says he is a servant. This is a humble way of addressing oneself when speaking with another of equal or superior rank. The psalmist knew his place. You ever heard your mom and daddy tell you something? <coughs> Younger kids probably don't know this. But older people used to say, don't get above your raisins. Don't forget where you came from. And that's what the psalmist was saying. He said, look, you've dealt with me really good. You've been good to me all my life. And because of that, I consider myself your servant. You are greater than I am. I am lower than you are. You don't have to do me good, but you do me good. And I am grateful that you do me good. And I want to be your servant. Are you a servant of God this morning? Amen. We talked a little bit about service this morning in Sunday school, and I, I guess I need to apologize to the Sunday school class because it got a little personal. But, but a servant is a person who's totally committed to God. Nothing has priority in his life but God, his relationship with God, his service for God. He has no rivals. He has no restrictions, no reservations. He does what God wants him to do, and he does it without equivocation. He doesn't argue with God. He doesn't debate with God. He doesn't try to bargain with God on whether it's right or not. He simply serves God. And when God called you, he called you to be a servant. Aren't you glad you can call yourself a servant? <clears throat> but then we look at his testimony. What is his testimony? It simply says there that he has dealt with him according, in like manner, similar manner, to his word. Divine, co divine communication, his promises, his precepts, the principles that are found in Scripture. God does not deal with you on an inarbitrary manner. He deals with you on a set standard. He has given you that standard in God's Word. And when we get away from that standard, then God has to bring us back to it. Amen. And He does it again. Why? You can talk out loud this morning. He does it because He loves you. Not because He wants to hurt you or harm you. God wants to help you. Let's say that again. God does it because He loves us. He wants to help he doesn't want to hurt. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? Amen. Think about that for a minute. The Almighty God who created everything, who looks at me in my sin, and He says, I want to help Him. Why? Because I can't help myself, and I need Him to help me. And if I let Him help me, things will be good, because He'll do it according to His Word that He has revealed to us in His Scripture, so I'll know how to conduct my life. And if I conduct my life according to what He says, then I won't have to be different. I do not want to go to God's timeout or to God's woodshed. I'd rather be on my knees before God and meaning God, your servants failed today. I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy and your grace and your love. That is why we come to church on Sunday morning so we can get right with everybody in this place and together we can come and offer God worship and praise and we can come down here if we need to. If you don't need to, it does you sometimes good. Just go to the front and bow down. Might be somebody else good. 
There's nothing bad about dogger. Hello? Amen. But he does it according to his word. You see, when, when God says, David, you're wrong, I can trust him. Look at the concern that the psalmist also had in verse 66. First thing, he said, teach, teach. The idea of training and educating, not just giving you the skills. This is the same word that is used of uh, Bezali in, 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 uh, in Exodus, when he's, uh, God's given him the gifts and talents on how to form and make everything in the tabernacle. And it has the idea of training someone in a skill, but also giving him the knowledge, the facts, the understanding on how to use that skill. When you got saved, God gave you a spiritual gift you did not have. Amen. We won't get into all that. But God gave you a gift. God expects you to use it because God has taught you how to use the gift that he's given you to honor and glorify him, not yourself. So God wants to teach us but he said, he teaches me what? Good, fairness, correct, proper, good, judgment. This, this is an interesting word. There's two words in here that are really interesting. And this is one of them. The word judgment originally meant to taste with the tongue. I got a little dog at home. Every time I offer him something, what, what does he do? He doesn't jump on it. He comes up, he sniffs it, and then he sticks his tongue out and if he don't like it, he won't take it. You see what that's telling us? That's telling us God is constantly <laughs> putting things before us that we have to test with our mind and taste with our mind to see if they're good or not. And then when it's applied to the mind or the mental process, then it means discretion and discernment. That's the Holy Spirit working within you to make you sensitive of something that might be bitter or sour instead of something that is sweet and satisfying. It was an amazing word when I sat there because I spent like a half a day looking this thing up. It was just amazing to me how it went from one thing over to an application of something else. And don't we do that? You ever been, to, you ever been somewhere somebody said, here, try this. I'm like, let me see what it tastes like first. You might be setting me up. It might be hot as fire and no water around. You know, so let me, you taste it. See, that's what he said. He says, God, teach me how to be discerning and tasting in the society in which I live according to your word and your, and your rule that I should be obeyed as, as your child. Then he wants knowledge. I love this word too. Experiential knowledge. Yeah, by various methods. <coughs> What's the best teacher? Experience. 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 It's the ups and downs in life. It's the failures and the, and the mistakes with the victories and the accomplishments, right? Because when you fail, you, you realize what you did wrong, you try to improve. When, when you have a, a victory and, and success, you see what you did right. And you try to replicate that so you can do it again. And that's what he said. He said, God, teach me how to live in this world according to your word so I can taste the world and see if it's good for me or not. And I will have the knowledge, fact, and experience to do that based on what you've already given me in your word. I think that's pretty good instructions for a brand new year. Teach me, Lord, to stay away from things that are tempting to me. Teach me, Lord, to avoid things that are bad for me. Teach me, God, not to be around people who bring me down all the time. The world's filled with Debbie, Debbie down. You know that? People grow up complaining about every single thing most every day. I don't want to be around that kind of person. Nothing offensive to nobody. I want to be around somebody that's uplifted and excited. But then that was that he wanted to be taught, but then he trusted. He said, believe. Re receiving sentence, he says, for I believe your commandments, your word, your principles, your promises that you put in Scripture. I believe that. Verse uh, 67, we have his, his conviction. And this is where we all need to stop paying attention here for a minute. Notice what he starts off with. Before, there was a time before something happened. When I was living in luxury, when everything was going great, when everything was fine, I was 
getting further and further and further away from God because I was letting more and more of the world come in and I was getting satisfied. I was getting desensitized. So, so everything that the world had, I thought was good. That was before. But then he says, there was a test. Before I was afflicted. Now see, a lot of people would, would love to just mark this out. Because they can't picture a God that will afflict his children. They think he's mean and he's cruel and he's hateful. The word afflicted literally means to be oppressed and then to be humble. You say, well, preacher, this is Old Testament stuff. It is. But you read in the New Testament, the Bible says that God disciplines or chastens any child that he calls his son. That's right. Anybody that he brings into it. And see, why, why does God do that? He does it to get you out of sin. He saved you out of the sin and the muck and mire of this world and he raised you up to a spiritual condition and then slowly but surely if you're not a really spiritually intent person growing, reading, and studying the Bible every single day, you will slowly start to get away from God. Little by little. And That's then right. all of a sudden one day you'll realize, hey, I'm out of God's will. How do you realize that? Not because you're smart, but because God afflicts you. The way this word is, this, this, this can be a physical affliction or a mental affliction. Pressure, stress. You ever caught you, yourself so stressed out you couldn't even sleep at night? You're too good, too much. You need to get back to word. Let the word of God soothe you and be a healing bomb in you. Doesn't the Bible say that there is a bomb in Gilead? It's in this word. And we need to get back there. He said there was a time before when I was just running around living in the world. And then all of a sudden God tested me. He afflicted me. And look at the transgression. It says before I went astray. Now most of us in English think went astray means to wander. It does not. It means to commit an error. It means to sin inadvertently by ignorance or negligence. Example. The Bible says thou shalt not kill. I know that. But what if I'm out in the field working with someone and we have an industrial accident and I kill that person, run over with a tractor or a tree falls on him, whatever. I knew that it was wrong to kill, but I inadvertently did it. That's the kind of sin it's talking about. It's not talking about openly sin. Because that's the kind of sin that gets you. It's not the big, bad, bold sin that stands up in God's face. But it's the little sin that we kind of sneak on the side. And everybody has their little sin that they sneak on the side. Amen. Hello? Amen. Men and women, children too. And we can start a list and just list them right on down the line. There's no, no need in it. The point is, we commit sin. And the more we commit sin, the more we get desensitized to it, and the more we get involved in it, and the further we get away from God, and the, and the, the more you get into sin, the, the least amount of effect the Holy Spirit has on your life, you get more and more deeper into sin. And you get to the point that you can justify everything you do. Amen. You can rationalize it. And when we get to that point, we're totally out of God's will. But he said, there was a time when I was doing that, God afflicted me. Why? Because I had gone astray. I committed sin against God. And then he testifies. Now, right now, after you've afflicted me at a particular point in time, I began to keep your commandments again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I think that's good stuff. For a brand new year, I've got to realize that I get out of God's will and that God has to get me back in His will and God will do anything that He has to to get me back in His will. Amen. Amen. That's why it's so dangerous to put, uh, to put excuses before God. Sure. You need to be careful about that. But God loves you. He's simply trying to get you back where you belong. Amen. He's not doing it because He can He's doing it because he has to. Because he loves you. We have a heavenly father in heaven who loves you more than any physical father you've ever had. Amen. Amen. He's doing more for you. And sometimes, just like your physical father, doesn't it say in Hebrews also that we have, uh, have uh, parents 
who, who beat us when we needed it, corrected us, and we went along with that. You did in my house or you didn't stay in the house. And so when God disciplines him, what, is the, what, what should be our response? I'll tell you what it should be. God, you're right, I'm wrong. I surrender. I can't do it. I can't fight against you, God. I know I can't fight against you. I'm trying as hard as I can because I love the world. I like what I'm doing. I like what I'm involved in. I don't see nothing wrong with everybody else is doing it. But then God says, but you're mine. And because I paid for you with the blood of Jesus to release you from that sin, then I have to do this to get you back in the family so I can love you and bless you and care for you more and comfort you when you go through the world in which we live. That's what it's all about, God. Look at this. Look at verse, uh, verse, the last part of that, uh, verse 68. Here's this commitment. Look at the traits of God he talks about. He said, God, you're good. Morally good. God is absolutely, infinitely perfect. You understand that? That's right. Nothing, nothing bad with God whatsoever. Or God could not be holy. No <laughs> sin in God. No hatred. No bitterness. Uh, none of that stuff can be in God because God is morally good. And not only is God good, but then the psalmist said that you do good. You to, to do good means to deal rightly and justly with everybody. Now I think that's the greatest thing I've heard in this whole thing is that God deals with me right. If I sin, he corrects me. If I'm obedient, he blesses me. Amen. You know what he says in Deuteronomy? Amen. He says, I set before you today life and death. You can either obey and, and have the blessing and the comfort of God and the promise of God, or you can disobey and be disciplined. How do you want to live your life? God gave you a choice. How do you want to live your life? You want to be committed to God? You want to be serving God? You want to have the blessing of God in your life? Then you've got to get in line with God. And I know that won't preach in some churches. Because it don't sound good, does it? And I apologize to you if you're offended. But that's just the truth. That's the truth of God's Word. Right. That you've got to get in line with God in order for God to bless you. Amen. And then look at his teaching. He says... Teach, again, to impart knowledge. He loves God so much that he knows God is the source of all wisdom and knowledge in the world. And he says, God, I want your knowledge and your wisdom so I can live in the world and not sin and get away from you so you won't have to discipline me and then everything will be okay. That makes sense to me. Does it to you? It just makes common sense that if I obey, God's going to bless. And he wanted it according to his what? Statutes. A mandate prescribed on a regulation, a degree, or a custom. What he simply said is, God, your word is absolutely perfect. You've given it to me for a guide. The Bible, B-I-B-L-A. Somebody tell me what, what it means. Y'all know. Basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-A, right? Are you following the instructions? Can you hear the instructions? Do you read the instructions? Most of us, when we buy something new, and you open the package up, what's the first thing you see in it? An instruction man. Why? Because I'm ignorant, and I don't know how to put this thing together. So they said, they knew that. So they said instructions, so I know how to put it together. You see where I'm going with this? God knows you. He knows we're going to slip away, so he gave us the instruction book, so we want them. But if you don't read the instruction, you don't know. Let me get a little more personal with you. If you don't read the instruction, you don't care. You don't care. I'm fine, you're fine, we're all fine, let's just be fine. Let's just go home and drink, party, and be merry, and it's going to be okay. It's not, folks. Cautions to Christians how to avoid Satan's snares. You realize, and I hope you realize this, that you're in a battle with Satan. Amen. That's right. God's won the war. Amen. But we're in battles every day. We're in skirmishes. And God's given you the way to get around those skirmishes, and that's to make you aware. 
And if we're not aware that we slip away and stray away from God, then we'll do it inadvertently. That's what the Word said. Not deliberately. You talk to a fisherman, he don't lie to you deliberately, but he does it because he does it. How big was the fish you caught? That big. <laughs> Doesn't mean to lie. He just... See, so we need to be careful. And that's the whole point of this series, is just so that we be careful going into 2020. That we realize that God loves us more than anything in this world. He loves you as an individual. That's right. And because He loves you, He wants to bless you. And because He wants to bless you, He has prescribed the way to do that. And He expects you to be obedient to His commands. I ask you again, are you straying or are you staying close to God? Father, thank you that you have given us cautions, you've given us warnings. Help us, dear God, to be aware of those warnings. Help us to heed those cautions. Father, that we may enjoy our fellowship with you every single day. There is nothing greater in this world than to have fellowship with you. Father, thank you for the privilege. Thank you, dear God, for every blessing. For we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.